We visited the moon six times between 1969 and 1972, and we left behind a lot of evidence. Each mission left a lunar module descent stage which is 31 feet across if you count the landing gear, or 13 feet across if you don't. We also left flags, sets of footprints, scientific experiments, and discarded equipment. The last three missions left lunar rovers. There are 250 Earth tons of man-made stuff on the moon, and about 20% of it came from manned Apollo missions. One side of the moon always faces Earth due to tidal locking, and this side was chosen for Apollo missions to maintain radio contact with Earth. Because of this, all six Apollo landing sites are always facing towards us. So, is it possible to see any of the landing sites from Earth using a telescope? Let's find out. The moon is about 240,000 miles from Earth and takes up only one half of a degree of the sky. That's so far away that the sunlight it reflects takes 1.3 seconds to reach us. It takes a lot of zoom just to see the moon in this much detail. Here are the United States for scale. If we were on the moon looking back at Earth with the same equipment, we would only have gotten this close. Let's take a closer look at the Sea of Tranquility, where we first walked on the moon. This dark plain of solidified volcanic lava was mistaken for a body of water by astronomers in the 1600s, and contains the landing site of Apollo 11. Here's the state of Texas for scale. When you zoom in this close, you can see that variations in the air density in our atmosphere cause light to refract and ripple. The more you zoom in, the more pronounced this effect becomes. Let's visit the southern edge of the Tranquility Plain. At this point, things are getting a little too wobbly to see clearly. Here's the city of Houston for scale. Astrophotographers can get past this wobbly problem to some degree by taking hundreds of video frames and stacking them to average out the atmospheric distortion. Here's my attempt that blends about a thousand images over three ideal nights, revealing craters as small as a mile across. This is about as clear of a view as you can see using hobbyist equipment. If we zoom in a little closer, we can see three craters named after Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, and Neil Armstrong. Below Collins, there's a crater group called the Cat's Paw, and just 3.5 miles east of this formation is the Apollo 11 landing site. It's lost in atmospheric distortion and camera noise artifacts, and takes up less than a pixel at this scale, but it's right there. Let's get a little closer to the Cat's Paw. This is an image that combines six of the best amateur images of this area that I could find online. This is the absolute best case image for a home telescope setup if you have excellent equipment, excellent seeing conditions, a lot of experience, and a lot of time. Here's an area of the Earth at the same scale blurred to the same level. Can you guess what that light area in the top left is? That's the Kennecott Copper Mine near Salt Lake City, Utah. It's the largest man-made excavation on Earth, and we would barely be able to see it if it were on the moon. What if the atmosphere wasn't in the way? This is a simulated view of what the Hubble telescope might see. Hubble was not designed for lunar surface photography and doesn't have the zoom or resolution necessary to see a lunar module. When pointed at the moon, one pixel of Hubble's camera sensor covers about 560 feet of the moon's surface. A lunar module would only be one-third of one percent of the area of one Hubble pixel. Even with modern sensors and optics, you would need a mirror at least 300 feet across to have enough angular resolution to recognize a lunar module. That's a telescope 100 times the size of Hubble. Surprisingly, Earth-based observatories have advanced to the point that they outperform Hubble, even with the atmosphere in the way. Some observatories have adaptive optics that can correct for atmospheric distortion in real time, and can use interferometry from several linked telescopes to obtain the equivalent angular resolution of a 230-foot mirror. This allows them to resolve lunar details 430 feet across. This is a simulated view of what the Very Large Telescope in Chile might see. It's miles better than what you can see at home, but there's no telescope on or above Earth that can see Tranquility Base. We have to enter lunar orbit for that. 
The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's narrow-angle cameras take photos one and a half miles across, with a spatial resolution of one and a half feet per pixel. This means an object like the Lunar Lander is 20 pixels across and 400 total pixels. We can finally see Tranquility Base. If we take several images from different times of lunar day, we can make an animated time-lapse revealing footprints, experiments, and abandoned equipment. It's unmistakable evidence of one of the coolest things humanity has ever done. A celestial time capsule of Cold War space race history, hidden just out of sight by 62 miles of life-sustaining atmosphere and 240,000 miles of cold, deadly, radioactive emptiness. It's amazing that we ever crossed that barrier, let alone nine times, and we'll hopefully be going back in the next couple of years with the goal of becoming interplanetary travelers. There's nothing humanity loves more than an impossible challenge. If you enjoy an impossible challenge as much as I do, and want to attempt to image the smallest targets on the moon, here are some tips. Wait for a night where the moon's terminator, the line between light and dark, is almost at the area you want to observe. This will give you much more contrast and make much smaller features visible. You'll get two chances per month during lunar, sunrise, and sunset. There are apps and websites that show you a forecast of where the Terminator will be, so you can plan your observation in advance. I'll link some in the description. Second, wait until the moon is as close to straight overhead as possible so you have less wobbly atmosphere to look through. This is called the culmination. You can look up lunar culmination times and plan on a couple hours on either side for the sharpest seeing conditions. Any space object you want to look at in detail should be at least 30 degrees above the horizon. Third, check jet stream conditions. If you have fast-moving air overhead, there is no hope of seeing any fine details clearly. The turbulence will ruin any attempt at imaging. Fourth, use a dedicated planetary camera. Use SharpCap to record SCR format videos with as high of a frame rate and as low of an exposure time as you can while still getting a well-exposed image. Record three minutes at a time to a high-capacity solid-state drive. These three-minute videos are around 20 gigabytes each, so hard drive space runs out quickly. Process and stack the videos using AutoStackert and discard the blurriest frames. Sharpen the resulting TIFF files in Registacks using Wavelets. Then use Affinity Photo or any similar photo processing software to stack and process your best images. I'll link all of the software I use below, as well as a few tutorials on how to use it. I hope you feel inspired to explore the moon for yourself. No matter what equipment you have access to or what level of technical skill you have, there is nothing more peaceful and awe-inspiring than a night of moon gazing. If you get an image that you're proud of, please send it to scienceyoucando at gmail.com. I might do a show and tell video in the future. Please like, subscribe, and comment if you have any ideas for future videos. Thank you.